One of these films acts as the final part of a beloved spiritual trilogy of Lovecraft adaptations that are directed by Stuart Gordon, starring Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton. The other film takes a simple plot and setting and collects up the weirdness dial, leaning deeper into the abyss of H.P. Lovecraft's strange universe. But which is the best? Director Stuart Gordon burst onto the scene in 1985 with Reanimator, one of the greatest debuts in horror. A loose Lovecraft adaptation, it highlighted the eccentric talents of Jeffrey Combs as Dr. Herbert West, and promoted Barbara Crampton as a new Scream Queen to keep an eye on. It's a wild ride, balancing comedy and insane gore, and it remains a permanent fixture in horror fans' favourites of the 1980s. The trio returned the very next year with From Beyond, Another loose adaptation that shared Reanimator's themes of meddling with science, resulting in humorous madness and monstrous body horror. Expectations for another return to that universe were high, but when Castle Freak finally arrived almost a decade later, it fell a little short. It was still a Lovecraft adaptation, in this case borrowing from the story The Outsider. It was still the same director and lead cast. But producer Brian Yusner did not return in this instance, having since becoming an established horror director himself. Perhaps more importantly, what did not return was a marketing budget. Full Moon Productions was in the midst of a financial struggle and was unable to even create posters for the film. Ultimately, Castle Freak snuck out as a director video release, still sought out by big horror fans, but otherwise making a relatively small splash. But, removed from time and its troubled release, how does the film actually fare? Castle Freak is the story of a family who unexpectedly inherit a large castle in rural Italy after the death of the father's unknown relative. They plan to sell it, but while they wait for all the inventory to be catalogued and paperwork to be formulated, they somewhat reservedly agree to stay and live in the castle. So, that all sounds like a rather nice family holiday in sunny Italy, right? Oh no, this is a horror film, of course bloody not. It just so happens that the deceased relative was keeping her now deformed monstrous son locked up in chains down below, feeding him scraps, brutally whipping him on a daily basis. And it turns out the guy didn't really like that treatment, so he's feeling rather angry and murderous right now. Even if we ignore the elephant-sized castle freak in the room, the internal conflicts within the small family unit is horror enough itself. From the moment we meet them, Mama Susan is seemingly acting overprotective and treating her husband in a very cold way. It is curious and a little awkward, though their daughter is blind, so her concerns for her safety in this huge old building are warranted. But then it comes to light. Husband John had alcohol issues in the past, but he's now nine months sober. He's trying. I'm sat here watching thinking, yeah, just forgive the guy. But then it really comes to light. Drunk off his tits, John caused a serious car accident. He got out unscathed, but it caused his daughter's blindness and his younger son JJ to die. Yeah, suddenly I'm siding with Susan a little more. As you can tell from this synopsis, the tone of Castle Freak is distinctly darker than either Reanimator or From Beyond. The zany fun of those films is replaced with a more mature, serious take on guilt, grief, and trauma. That alone makes the film less outwardly entertaining on the surface, I respect their choices, as opposed to just repeating the same tricks over and over. Watching John's gradual character arc as he searches for redemption, standing by his side as he comes to terms with his actions and his loss, is a real journey. When obstacles are thrown his way, such as discovering a cellar full of untouched tasty wines, we root for his success. Even when he succumbs to his demons, I can't fully hate on the guy. Partly this is good writing. The pressures and the stress mounted on John and his family are crystal clear, and the way the backstory of the Castle Freak intertwines with his own story is near perfect. But this is also largely due to Combs' performance. A few later scenes allow him to slip into the more recognisably wild performances of Dr. Herbert West, but on the whole, he surprised me with his ability to deliver a touching, broken character. Speaking of sympathetic characters, before we are introduced to the family, we see the previous owner of the castle doling out her mad fury on the castle freak. It is depicted as cruel and unjust, like Stuart Gordon really wanted us to feel sorry for this guy, despite the glimpses of terror we see. Well, that sympathy vanishes as soon as he absolutely annihilates this fucking ginger cat. Cats don't last long in Stuart Gordon movies, so I know it was coming, but still. The tone of castle freak might not be as comedic as expected, but the film still delivers on the expected gore. Jesus Christ. 
There is at least one particular image that is now burned into my scarred brain forevermore. There's no way I can show it on YouTube, which is good, so I can just edit around it. That said, the gore is well executed. Some great practical effects, real grimy stuff. The design of the castle freak himself is pretty decent. It's less monstrous than I was anticipating, but then again, it's not some demon. It's just a guy that's been isolated in a cage since the age of five. So in that sense, the makeup department did a primo job. I have a thing about nails, so these overgrown puppies did get to me. We also get a full on close up of the monster's dangling, bulging nutsack. I don't get to say that too often. Personally, I prefer it when the villain is wrapped up in the bloody blanket. Not only does it help obscure the villain's true features until deeper into the runtime, and not only does it obscure his dangling, bulging nutsack, but it just works. There is something about the simplicity. The real horror of this film isn't the castle freak, however, it's Barbara Crampton's wardrobe. Other than that, I don't have much to say. The blind daughter's handicap is used effectively, both for scenes of suspense and to further highlight John's initial inability to care for his loved ones. It is used relatively sparingly, and never feels overdone or in bad taste. Overall, the film does feel kind of cheap, with some of the early scenes looking like they came straight out of an early 80s Italian exploitation flick. Gordon accepted the low budget of 500 grand in order to gain full control over the picture, which is fair enough, as he proves he knows how to spend the budget where it counts. It's not a masterpiece or a classic or any other overblown word that gets tossed around far too casually on the internet, but it is a solid worthwhile 90s horror. So, there is technically room for improvement, and a remake could potentially borrow what worked and improve upon what didn't. 2020 was already a freaky enough year without the return of Castle Freak in December, just in time to celebrate a particularly morbid holiday season in style. The story of the troubled married couple and their blind daughter has shifted towards a more conventional group of horror characters. A gang of teenagers, or young adults who still act like they're fucking teenagers, are now to focus. Rebecca, the blind character, is now the lead. After the opening scene, which is just a more religiously tinged update of the original's freak whipping, we meet Rebecca on a night out, with her eyesight still intact. Inside we meet her dysfunctional group of friends, and I fucking mean dysfunctional. The friendships and low budget horrors are often shaky, but here I do not know why any of them hang out together. It's all very forced and awkward. Rebecca's boyfriend is introduced flirting with the other girl in the gang, both of which act like Rebecca was in the room for showing up. The others are all pounding drugs and alcohol, while the nerdy guy called the Professor rants about lizard people. Cold-blooded humanoid reptilians that live among us. The boyfriend, John, gets all kinds of fucked up and decides to drive Rebecca home. Aha, you're thinking, you know where this is going. Connect. John crashes the car, which results, of course, in Rebecca's blindness. And then she gets a call telling her a relative died. She's inherited their castle, which is now in Albania, not Italy and then they invite all their troublesome friends along to help sort it out. They promise Rebecca there'll be no drugs or partying. She's a bit sensitive to all that kind of stuff after what happened. But guess what? Here's my fundamental problem with the remake. In the original, John was flawed but there was a likeability to the guy who carried the whole emotional weight of the story. Here, John is just an absolute slimy cunt. From that sleazy introduction, he doesn't get any better. No redemption arc for this fucking twat. Hey, get the fuck off my car, man! Get in your car! He shows no remorse whatsoever for getting high and drunk and blinding his girlfriend. Don't. Why not? I'm not in the mood. Oh, come on, you're never in the mood anymore. Man, I wish you could forgive me. He continuously acts dodgy, going behind her back. He lies to his blind girlfriend multiple times. What color is my mother's robe? In my dream, it was red. It's blue. <laughs> the robe's blue. Further abusing her lack of sight, which he, again, inflicted. He's a hypocrite. He decides to buy a load of drugs to drug Rebecca, then gets angry when his friends also show up with drugs. Oh, Rebecca finds out you have it, she's gonna flip. Dude, she's blind. Larry, shut the fuck up, man. The chicken sense things. I don't know. The chicken sense things. The chicken sense things. The chicken sense things. The chicken sense things. And then, he actually goes ahead and cheats on her. Just fucking fuck this guy. The original John's initial incident of blinding his young daughter and killing his son is actually worse than the new John, but the old John showed remorse, and a shit ton of guilt to the point of constant suicidal thoughts. 
I recognise this is partially down to how we're shown the events. In the original, we meet John and get to empathise with him a little before we're shown his tragic backstory. Whereas in the remake, we jump in right at the scummy point. But beyond that, the new John is just a seriously unlikable douche, which unfortunately soured a fair chunk of my viewing. Most of the characters are not as repulsive as him, but are still obnoxious and sleazy in their own ways. From cold, jealous bitches to heroin junkies who insist on shooting up in someone else's property. It's a smell. Smell that? They basically introduce Albania by showing a creepy dude and his dead cow, which is nice. Like Black Christmas, the remake also doubled down on peeping toms and their peepholes. Much of the film itself feels like a bloody peep show. Literally every female character in the film gets their nips out at least once, and some of the guys do too. On top of that, they added in a whole new subplot about possession and invasive incest dreams that make you finger yourself. And then of course, there is the already infamous rape scene. Ay ay ay. We have to get to it eventually, let's just get it over with now. So, the castle freak is now a woman. In other words, she's a castle freak. Castle freak. She's castle freak here. Anyway, John cheats on Rebecca with a cold jealous bitch. They fuck blindfolded. Oh boy. Castle Freak tears that girl a new one, literally, and steps up to the plate, so to speak. I don't know what to say. I guess it's a fun talking point if you're watching with friends or whatever. But I don't know. Fuck it, go ahead. Fuck you, John. Have a taste of your own shitty medicine. The cheapness goes beyond the material too, sadly. No discredit to Fangoria for producing the film, I like what they do. But the film feels even lower budget than the original. There was a tacky blue and red lighting combo that crops up all too often often without a light source that makes sense in story. Maybe it's a throwback to Argento and those guys, but eh, it just comes across as unnecessary and, as I said, tacky. The opening credits are a little better. They share a retro styling that matches an old Hammer Horror. Now, of course, Castle Freak was never a Hammer Horror either, but the castle name and setting at least fits the Hammer style. The car crash is obviously a big moment, but plays out like a damp squib. This character gets attacked by a rush of flies, but there are no flies to be seen, not even little digital buggers. And to end this annoying nitpicking rant, it borrows stock audio that is distracting and was already old fashioned when used for late 90s first person shooters. <laughs> I'm sorry, it sounds like I hated the film, but I didn't really. There's positives here too. The castle itself is pretty nifty. It's perhaps the one big element of fighting against the otherwise low budget production feel. Lovecraft fans might respect the remake's attempt to cement the story in that universe a bit more firmly, with appearances from the Necronomicon, and a ritual of Yorksopoth, and constant chatter about the Old Ones and the Elder Gods and whatnot, it feels 100% more Lovecraftian than the original. Barbara Crampton, who did not return as an actress, but as a producer, claimed she wanted to spark a new Lovecraft cinematic universe of sorts. I won't spoil the film's ending, but that definitely seems to be the case. However, it results in what I didn't think was a great ending to the Castle Freak story, but rather a jumping off point for tie-ins. And then, like a true cinematic universe, there is a post credit sting. It involves a certain Dr. Herbert West, which adds further fuel to that fire. So we may well be back here ranting about a reanimator remake a couple years down the line, or better yet, they will take a familiar fan favourite character and chuck him into a fresh storyline. I'd have no qualms with that. Now then, onto my verdicts best villain. I'm gonna go with the original Castle Freak here. I much prefer his simple, yet tragic backstory of a child who suffered for his father's sins. It's much better than the convoluted cult ritual malarkey that the remake tacked on. Their designs are pretty similar, but I feel the original treats the character to better lighting and framing, which can make all the difference. The remake monster often looks too much like a rubbery suit under the flatness of the film. Also, I gotta hand it to him for that glorious, dangling, bulging nutsack. Come on. Best lead character. No surprise here. I'm going with John, played by Jeffrey Combs. He's a fully fleshed out character who has a lot of problems, but he's trying his best under some very unusual circumstances. Rebecca is the hero of the remake, and while she's alright, too much of the screen time is dedicated to the dickheads around her instead. Best overall cast. Again, no surprise. I hated the aforementioned dickheads. The original's focus on the three family members gave time for their characters to breathe and grow. And shout out to the neighbourhood policeman too, he's a welcome side character who I can respect. 
I respect what's sorely missed in the remix cast. Are you saying I did it myself? Why would I break my own mirror? Maybe you don't like what you show. Best uh, overall uh, kill. The remake might have the original beat in terms of body count, but I prefer the kills in the old one. There are still over the top moments that go a little too far, but there is a grittiness to them, as opposed to the cheap sliminess of the remake. Also, the kills in the remake are fine, but a little plain. Horror fans have seen the whole eye gouging thing ten times too many. A little more creativity like the heroin addict scene would have been more welcome. Best to kill. For the best singular kill, sorry to say, I'm going back to 1995 again. And the maid stumbles across the miraculously still alive prostitute. It's already a moment of shared empathy, shock and horror. And then, the bloody blanket shape appears from behind. You get the lookout moment, and then you get the blam, blam, blam. You don't even see the damage being caused, and you really don't need to. The noise is coming from the freak, and the ferocity with which he bludgeons this poor woman to death with his chains is just scarily on a primal level. Best film. Well, what do you know? It's a clean sweep for the original, in my opinion. Best story, best mystery, best characters and the best kills, great atmosphere, decent location, sad feelings over a murdered ginger cat, it's all good. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any of my choices. And indeed, let us know if you are excited for a Lovecraft cinematic universe that could be sprouted from this remake. <laughs>